Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cocktails and Rocktails with me, your most notorious groupie, Alice Rouse, author of this little ditty right here. Not even half the story, 573 pages, twice as long as every other groupie book on the face of the earth. And like I said, still not even half the story. These other little books right there, you guys, where you can get that, the merchandise, everything is down in that link, so go down, fiddle about, see what you find. And you guys, you know what I found here? A really awesome community. You guys have just been so amazing, so wonderful. And I swear I'm going to, I'm answering emails. I'm starting to slowly get back to them. It's just been a really rough kind of, you know, depression is like a roller coaster. You have your highs and your lows. And you just get through them. So kind of just got through with the low, obviously, with everything going on in my life and father passing and stuff. So thank you guys for all the love, all the support, all the friendships, all the community. And Desiree, I love you, girl. You rock. So thank you, everybody, for being so amazing, so awesome. I will get back to you, I swear to God, I promise. And speaking of getting back to things, you guys, we are going to get back to some stuff today. Because we did it. We did, everybody seemed to love that Freddie Mercury episode. So I did a couple others along with it. So today, you guys, we are going to talk about... The top 10 most expensive. And we say hi to my baby Beluga. Say hi, baby Beluga. All right. So anyway, we're going to talk about the top 10 most expensive rock star items sold at auction. You guys, it's amazing. And where people get the money, like I said, outside of the hard rock or a corporation that buys these things, museums. Because museums buy these as well, not just the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of, Museum of Art. So it's just astounding. Because you think about the history of things that sell at auction for an amazing amount of money. Rockstar items always go, depending on the rockstar, depending on the price. But we're going to talk about that today, you guys. And today, we're going to have a nice little local, you guys. If you can find this vodka where you guys live, you it is amazing vodka they the five wives are local this is their moscow mule they're local here to salt lake city and during pride month they make the five husbands for the you know people who like the husbands and they have little roosters over their roosters like if you look up at close now this is actually based on a real vaudeville troop of mormon wives and their whole shtick was come see our pussies and at the end of the show, they would bring out these little cats. So, who's to say the Mormons don't have a sense of humor? So, everybody, grab your five wives, kick up your feet. Let's have a little cocktails and rocktails, shall we? Oh, so this is their Moscow Mule. The five wives vodka is really, really smooth, crisp, really clean. You guys would really love it. So, everybody, grab your vodka, kick up your feet, and let's have a little cocktails and rocktails. Cheers, big ears. All right, let's do that again. I caught a little bit of the bubbly in my mouth and almost choked. <laughs> I rarely choke on things going down my throat, but this kind of threw me for a loop. So, all right, everybody. Cheers, big ears. So good. I've had these before. I love their Moscow Mules. They're absolutely delicious. They use Krabby's ginger beer in it. Like I said, love the Five Wives. If you find these, pick them up. Enjoy a little Mormon sense of humor from behind the Zion Curtain. Okay, guys, let's get into it today. Because like I said, rock star items and auctions, oh my God, you can go to heights that you never thought possible. So we're going to start with the number 10, the cheapest one on this list. So this is Bob's, Bob Dylan's lyrics for Like a Rolling Stone. So this is a huge musical you know this is part of rock and roll history for so many reasons because of the era and everything that was going on at the time and how bob dylan became a folk singer that he plugged in so this is obviously going to interest a lot a lot of people okay so this is the they feature handwritten lyrics in pencil along with doodles and i'll find all the pictures and i'll put them right here and thoughts as an unused lyrics, driver Muth, you tell the truth, it feels real, does it feel real? Get down and kneel, raw deal, shut up and deal. These are things that were never in the final cut of the, like a Rolling Stone song. So, 
those, and this is number 10 on the list. Keep in mind, I'm going backward. I'm going cheapest to most expensive. So Bob Dylan's, um, it doesn't say what the actual um, reserve was. And it's just like four sheets of lyrics on a hotel stationery. Now, how many things do we have on hotel stationery, ladies, who are groupies? We have so many rock star signatures with their phone numbers. Everything gave our phone numbers on the hotel paper. So this actually really makes a lot of sense. All right. So you want to know how much they went for? With premium and everything? $2,725,000. Because part of rock and roll history. $2 million for four pages of something that Bob Dylan, who is still alive and well... Really, just such an iconic part of rock and roll history. And people want to keep these histories alive. So this is one way to do it. So pretty expensive, but not the most expensive thing on the list. And you guys, kind of think in your mind. Tell your, Ask yourself, what do you think would be the most expensive thing? Put it down in the comments. Tell me what you thought as compared to what it's going to be. All right, so number nine. We just talked about this on Freddie Mercury's... Uh, video. So we know that his um, Freddie Mercury's piano went for a little bit more than this one did. And this is John Lennon's piano that he wrote on Imagine. Yep. We just talked about this. So it was put up for auction. And of course, it drew the A listers. You know, Mariah Carey bought Marilyn Monroe's. You know, so I would imagine even Paul McCartney probably was bidding on this. Possibly Ringo Starr. But definitely had a lot of rock and roll, rock stars bidding on it, including like the hard rock and stuff like that. Businesses like that. So that makes a lot of sense. So John Lennon's piano. Now this is in American dollars as compared to the pound. So the way the British pound falls, this Freddie Mercury's with the premium with everything actually ended up making more than this one. So John Lennon's, excuse me, I do that. I just have no manners anymore. The older you get, go out the window. So anyway, John Lennon's Imagine Piano in American dollars, $2,739,000, which you know is only 14,000 more than the lyrics for Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone went for. You could sit there on John Lennon's piano with Bob Dylan's lyrics. Huh. But they probably did their drinking and smoking together already. And speaking of lyrics and pianos and music being composed, now this one in a boss-ass marketing move, American hip-hop group Wu-Tang Clan released just one copy, one, of their seventh studio album called The Shaolin Experience. I believe that's what it was. Let me see here. The Shaolin album. Now, the Shaolins are a group of monks, you know, that are martial martial arts, a pot dealer, my massage therapist. He used to get be a Shaolin um, practicer. Not a monk, but he practiced Shaolin and the purposes and everything, the principles behind it. So he, that's how I know what a Shaolin is. So they released the one time, the one album, and it says Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. But among the collecting world, it is known as the Shaolin album. Now, I don't know who bought this. I would like to know who bought this. Oh, hold on. So, this one sold for $2,666,741. So, $2.7 million close in 2015. It was secretly recorded over six years. And this is the most expensive work of music ever. Even more expensive than, uh, what's his name? Bob Dylan's lyrics. Wait. How could it be? It was only 2672 Oh, with the premiums. So, yeah, with the premiums and stuff, it did go further. But now this album has taken off a, li a life of its own. There's a whole documentary being... Who's it by? By, um... Oh, so Farmer Pro Martin Shrekel, Shrek Kelly. Oh, that's right. That's right. That fool who put insulin up to like 10000 a month and didn't care. Who was just trying to rape us of 
cash for things that was necessary for some humans to live, he bought it. And then this was actually seized as in his assets. And now it's, like I said, taken off a life of its own. So it's right now, the last anybody heard, it's sitting somewhere in the Department of Justice's halls for evidence against. And that's just insane. Like, yeah, because I remember the, the farmer guy, the young guy in his 20s who, like I said, really just skyrocketed insulin to 10000 a month, which nobody could afford. And because he was shady as fuck, obviously, he got busted for doing a lot of financial issues, you know, and being an asshole legally. So, yeah, so that's just sitting there. Nobody has possession of this record anymore. And it kind of goes, takes on a whole different part of the lore behind the album that now it's sitting in the Department of Justice. That's fucked up. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't know that about the Shaolin album. I remember, and I forgot that that guy was arrested. I remember he bought it, and he was just kind of an asshole about it. He really was. So, okay, let's move on from the Wu-Tang. And we're going to go. Across the pond. We are going to go to the UK to a drum kit. And I'm not talking about Charlie Watts. Now, Charlie Watts' drum kit has never been put on the market. He used pretty much the same drum kit his whole life. And according to, and when these, these instruments are absolutely 100% insured to be able to go on the road and Charlie Watts' drum kits was, at the time when he was alive, still playing it, pretty much uninsurable because it was just so priceless. But this drum kit, this drum kit that belonged to Ringo Starr that he used in over 200 performances and in a 2015 American Auction House, um, Ludwig actually sold it. The people who made his drum kit, they sold it for £2,939,000. But part of the proceeds were donated to the Lotus Foundation founded by Starr and his wife, Barbara Bach. So that was probably a condition of the sale. Because you can put these type of conditions onto auction items if you would like. Just like you do a reserve. Like, you can say, I will not sell this unless it's $1.2 million. And if it doesn't reach $1.2 no sell. If you don't um, abide by the sell by donating part of the proceeds, you don't get it. You broke the contract. So that's really cool. I'm really glad um, because it does promote social welfare. So a huge part, this is not only something that was rock and roll history that was saved, that was appreciated and put priceless, but you know what? Gave to help a part of the world which is even more priceless. So that's really awesome. All right, number six. This is John Lennon again, you guys, because he's part of the Beatles. And we're seeing three items by the Beatles already. And we're already four, we're only four items into the top 10. So John Lennon's Love Me Do guitar. So this guitar continues to see themes of expensive instruments. You can tell I'm reading this a little bit. The guitar was originally used on the recordings of Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You and was stolen from John Lennon at a 1963 Christmas concert. The Gibson guitar was in the possession of a normo John McCaw, so just some random guy who probably just was wandering around by the loading dock, you know, because the loading dock isn't like the hub of bragging where you meet rock stars, right? Anyway terror twins anyway so probably just some they were unloading they were loading the equipment after the show some douchebag came and just grabbed the guitar and left so this john mccaw had it for a few decades and said he bought it in the late 60s without knowing it's been stolen that's a 50 50 shot because let's go back to Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols. How did he start the Sex Pistols? Because he was stealing other bands, including David Bowie, probably Ringo Starr's equipment. What else are you going to do with it? You can't sell it because they're all friends. So this guy probably couldn't sell it, and he probably waited just a long, a, a long enough to know that the statutes of limitations had expired. So 
he made a healthy chunk from the sale, which went to went for three point two million Australian dollars because apparently this was in Australia. He profited 50% and donated 50% to the Spirit Foundation, a charitable organization that Lennon and his widow Yoko Ono created. So, okay, if he was the one that stole it, he just got out of his bad karma because that's good. He didn't know it was stolen, so he did kind of right by that, by donating some of it to John Lennon's charity, which is really cool. This is another thing about rockers who love the history. They have no problem helping out the world. They have no problem doing concerts for charities, you know? It's been a trend over the years, so that's really awesome to see that a huge chunk of it. So, after everything was done and said, he probably only took home around 900000 to a million. Okay, so let's move on. So, the Love Me Do guitar in American was 3,206,000. Now we're going to move on to another guitar. So this is one that was called the Reach Out to Asia Stratocaster. Another guitar rake, raked in a healthy profit for charity was the Strat signed by Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, Brian May, Jimmy Page, Jimmy, David Gilmore, Jeff Beck, Pete Townsend, Mark Knopfler, Ray Davies, Liam Gallagher, Ronnie Wood, Tony Iommi, Angus and Malcolm Young, Paul McCartney, Sting, Richie Blackmore, Def Leppard, and Brian Adams. Whoo! That's a lot of signatures, and a couple of those is like Jeff Beck. You cannot get any more. Mick Jagger doesn't really sign that often. Definitely Liam Gallagher. You definitely cannot get uh, Malcolm Young anymore. Ronnie Wood, nobody gives a fuck about his signature, so I'm sure that didn't have any value. <laughs> Just so that guitar was sold in an auction in Qatar. And that makes sense because, you know, the filthy rich, and I've spent a lot of time over the Middle East and Dubai, Bahrain, Jordan. So there's a lot, a lot of money that goes through there. And if they can covet something that is part of history, and especially rock and roll history, those rich Arabs are going to get it every fucking time because there's no limit. They can outbid anybody. So that makes sense. So... This auction, that we, so the Qatar auction was to raise funds to reach out to Asia, a charity forum to help the tsunami victims. So that's really awesome because you know what? This gave a lot of help to them in the amount of $3,740,000. So that's just number five on this list. Just number five. And I'll put the link down to this article in the description. So go down, you guys, because this is not a newer auction this is a little bit this article is a little bit older obviously because the freddie mercury auction just happened so i have a feeling a couple of these might be changed since that auction and the david bowie auction because i don't believe there's nothing about david bowie's auction on here but a few of those items and i, I have one that's coming up that was all about just david bowie's artwork in his collection it's fucking amazing okay so number four this is a pretty good one. God bless Pink Floyd's David Gilmore, who parted ways with his Black Strat guitar for a very healthy charity donation. Because David Gilmore's cool like that. And this was put on the auction directly from him, which isn't always the case, as we found out with a couple of the stolen items here. So, along with a bunch of other, other guitars, Gilmore sold his Strat, for a cool, I'm not going to say yet. The guitar was originally estimated 130,000 to 200,000, and after the sale, it formally held the record for the most expensive guitar in the world at the time. Keep that in mind at the time. I'm not going to read that because that's going to give away number one. Okay, so we guess number one, we guess what that is. Who do you think? Who do you think his guitar that is? Hmm. Don't look anything up. Tell me in the description. And then, again, tell me what you think when I tell you what number one is. Okay. So this guitar, David Gilmore's Blackstrat guitar, which, would you think of David Gilmore? He played this guitar for a huge part of his, the majority of his um, Pink Floyd life. So this has a huge part of rock and roll history, the wall, 
everything. He played this live. This guitar has seen so much stuff, including the back of Roger Waters' head. Because <laughs> they hate each other. So, David Gilmore's Black Strat guitar went for $5,298,000. We're getting up into the high zone here. We are. And that's just insane. But you know what? I could see that because it's not only belonging to David Gilmore. His Black Strat is a very old, original, rare Strat. So you have that on that with the David Gilmore on top of it. Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't go for more. But like I said, it was originally slated for 130000 to 200000 Now, you want to know who had a killer guitar and bass collection? John Entwistle. But then again, that's another episode. Because there was a huge auction of his items after his passing. Speaking of auctioning after someone's passing, this was auctioned off after an the biggest pop star in the world passed away. And this is this is kind of creepy, you guys. Just I'm I'm sorry if I give you nightmares for this, but right here. This is Michael a, a statue of Michael Jackson and his chimp bubbles. So this is oh it's a life-size golden statue. It's life-size! I know who the fuck bought that and put that I, I wouldn't even put that in my garden because I'm sure chink bubbles would like break free and weirdly lumber his way and choke you rip your fucking monkey face off I don't want this in my house but so this is a life science golden statue in Michael and Bubbles it was sculpted by the famous artist Jeff Koons oh my god that's why Jeff Koons Jeff Koons is, he's one of the top more modern artists who go for millions of dollars. Along with like Basquiat, so many others. So, wow, I did not read before that this, this was Jeff Koons. And it was a, designed in 1988. It originally sold that year for $250,000. But in 2001, another example of the edition, also by Jeff Koons. So I guess Michael Jackson had one and... There, there's two. So whoever has the second one, guess what? This sold in 2001 for $7,466,000. Buy one of Michael Jackson's kids for that shit. You know, but I don't know who bought that. Maybe Michael Jackson's kids did. Maybe they bought it to put it back in Neverland. But where the hell was that creepy ass thing in Neverland? Because it is creepy. Y'all saw it. It's so creepy about that. Really? I'm kind of surprised someone paid seven and a half million dollars for that. I'd pay seven hundred somebody seven and a half million dollars to get out of my creepy fucking face. Or not my creepy face, to get that creepy shit out of my face. Alright, so let's move on from creepy, weird sculptures of the man and his monkey. So this one is... A lot of people don't hear, this is number two on the list. So this is a 232 page of unaltered manuscript, dates back to 1817, and was secured by an unnamed winner. However, it's been reported that the four telephone bidders battled it out to own the Mahler piece. So this is by Gustav Mahler. He's, a simp he's along the lines of Beethoven and Bach. So he was a composer in the 1800s, went to a lot of the royal houses, was very famous, composed a lot, a lot of stuff for um, royalty, for the aristocracy, for the bourgeois. So this actually sold, this was his second symphony score, the complete manuscript of the composer's second symphony known as the Resurrection. And this sold in November, 2016 in the UK for $7,878,000. That I could see why. I mean, these manuscripts, they just don't survive. If a Bach or a Beethoven or Tchaikovsky went up one of their manuscripts, which they have, they will probably go for along the same lines, if not more. Because Mahler, he's a well-known, you know, composer, but he's not 
everybody knows Beethoven and Bach, right? So I would think, but that seven million, wow. I'd pay seven million to own it if I had it. Okay, and we are at the number one spot. Drum roll. Take a drink, everybody, because you're going to need it. Okay, so number one on the list. We know it's a guitar. And this was used during a 1993 MTV Unplugged performance. Nope, you guys. It's not the... Was it the guitar or the bass? I believe it was Mike Inez who had the bass on MTV Plugged that this is when Metallica first cut their hair that says, friends don't let their friends cut their hair. <laughs> this is not it, you guys. But it was used in 1993. What, what was happening in 93? Oh, grunge. Kurt Cobain's guitar that he used on MTV Plugged. Unplugged. Just And this was used just five months before he passed away and yeah Unplugged was a really amazing show it says it was considered one of the history's greatest lives performances and it was because so much was going on and Kurt Cobain was just so volatile and you never knew what was going to happen with him and there's a lot of things that happened on the Unplugged Gen Xers we know we all saw it we watched it this guitar that we all watched him play, that definitely, if you have not changed those strings, has DNA, Kurt Cobain DNA. You could clone Kurt. Although he's kind of a dick. I wouldn't want to. And I don't mean that he was always kind of a spoiled baby. Did what he wanted. Didn't give a fuck about anybody else. It wasn't Courtney Love that killed him, people. Trust me. I was living in Seattle. I talked about that in another episode. But yeah, so this guitar that he used on MTV Unplugged went for $8,013,000. The most expensive item guitar ever. Ever. And trust me, there are some guitars like Jimi Hendrix's guitar. And this was on, this guy had it, it was on several years ago on Pawn Stars, he wanted a million dollars for Jimi Hendrix's guitar. That guitar eventually went for three or four million. His white Stratocaster, I believe it was the one he used in Woodstock. Maybe not, but at the time, and this is, you know, 10, 15 years ago, he sold it. This was about the time, because this one sold, what year? Oh, five months before he died. Duh. 94. So 94. So, yeah. That makes... So... This went in 94, and the Jimi Hendrix guitar was taken on the show Pawn Stars after this. Because Pawn Stars didn't exist when this was sold. So, yeah, that's what it went for. That's the most expensive guitar ever sold. $8,013,000, the Kurt Cobain Unplugged Acoustic. Just insane. And you guys, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I've got a couple more of these on on deck. Like I said, John Entwistle, David Bowie, other rock star auctions. This, it's just insane what people, because that's how important music is to a lot of people. That's how important people want to preserve it. Because it has played such a huge part in our life. And especially for the Gen Xers. We know it's brought so much into our lives. It's shaped our generation. It was the center of our being as MTV started. We got to see all this stuff created. Some people got to see that live. So there you guys go. More expensive rock star memorabilia. I don't blame him. People just, it's just insane what they, because the value financial, the, monet the monetary value really doesn't reflect the actual spiritual and emotional value that people have for these things. They probably thought $8 million was a bargain. Because the way it makes us feel like when we go to concerts, priceless. Alright guys, hope you enjoyed today's episode. It was a lot of fun. You know, you guys know how much I love doing art and music. So this was fun for me. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And thank you everybody for getting to the end of the episode with me. Totally appreciate you guys and love all your support. And don't forget everybody at Patreon, start moving your memberships over here. 
because once I get everybody over here and I get enough members, we're going to do a lot of really awesome stuff. And thank you to Desiree, to Linda, to everybody with your, to um, Cat, uh, Black Cat Tarot. Sorry, you guys. Like I said, it's been a crazy few weeks, crazy couple months, really. So my brain is fried. So trying to remember everything. And plus, I'm getting older. And Alzheimer's runs in my family. So at least I'll have all this to remember it. God, what am I going to be like in the old folks' home? Somebody come get her. She's dancing like a stripper. That's going to be me in the old folks' home. All right, guys. So, for everybody who's just lurking about, just discovering the channel, but not yet subscribed or a member, go down. Hit those buttons from the share to the membership to the, to the um, subscribe, everything, and hit my bells. And we'll see you on the next episode at Cocktails and Rockdowns. Cheers, big ears.